this is what I'm going to talk about. Uh, I'm going to first talk about why I started studying career development in the first place. Um, and I'm going to talk about my cross to bear. That refers to Mr. Cross. That's why it's capitalized, not because I'm you know, privileging some religion over any others. Um, what the nagging problems are in career development that I have been trying to solve my entire career, or at least understand. I'm going to talk about the structural equation modeling or quantitative studies that I did, um, the grounded theory qualitative studies that I did, and what I learned from all of it and where we need to go next. Both learned kind of about myself and about the field. Oh, wait, let me go back. I can't leave out Mr. Cross. So I'm in high school, right? And I grew up on Long Island in a fairly traditional community in the 60s and um, came of age in the 60s. And uh, there were four career paths open to women at that time, four. Um, and in my high school, you pretty clearly identified yourself fairly early on. Um, you could be a secretary, you could be a school teacher, you could be a nurse, actually five if you count one of them, um, or an airline attendant. That was in the days when airlines were really a, like an amazing career adventure for women. Um, or you could be a housewife. Those were your choices. Um, I had I, I have screaming artistic interests. I, if you know the Holland reset codes, I am like an A off the charts, but I also have very strong eye interests, and I was very, very interested in science. I also kept having crushes on my science teachers, which made me want to become a scientist. Enter the picture, Mr. Cross, my guidance counselor. Um, I do not understand why we call them guidance counselors, because they don't actually guide you, as far as I can tell, except away from things you might want to do. <laughs> and Every year I went in for my annual meeting with Mr. Cross and I would tell him what I wanted to be and it usually corresponded with whatever teacher I had a crush on that year. And I went through, you know, wanting to be a geologist, wanting to be a, uh, an astronomer, wanting to be a, a geneticist. I don't remember. Each year it was something different and every single year I would have this long conversation with him and he would kind of sit there for a minute and look at me and then tell me that whatever that career path was, women couldn't do it, that I had to think of something different. Well, uh, I was always a little rebellious, but not enough at that point. So I became a school teacher, um, had a wonderful career teaching. I loved it, um, a 10 year career before I then went back to graduate school in psychology. Um, and decided to, um, uh, at that point I was teaching high school um, and I wanted to, I had a lot of kids that I saw with a lot of problems and I thought that I wanted to go back to graduate school and become a really fantastic clinician who would work with adolescents. That isn't exactly what happened, but um, uh, that's how I ended up returning to school at the age of 30 in order to become uh, a psychologist. So I credit Mr. Cross with my enduring interest in career development because I, there were so many people that I talked to, so many women that I talked to once I hit graduate school and we were all talking about careers all the time because Ohio State where I got my degree was a hotbed of career research. Um, we all got into these conversations about how we got steered away from things we wanted to do. So that was the impetus for um, how I got going on this. Now let's move on to what I sort of learned in my early um, uh, introduction to career development about one, what some of these nagging problems were that I exemplified and that all of my, uh, many of my friends. So I, I'm talking about this as five persistent problems in women's career development. These are problems that people started documenting in the 1950s with some of the earliest vocational research. And these problems are largely now in 2015 still 
um, as problematic, in some cases more problematic, or in some cases differently problematic than they were back in the 1950s, but still problematic. The first has to do with the underrepresentation of women uh, in the vocational arena and underemployment. I'm not going to go through all of these things because it would take me an hour to do each of these slides, but it includes things like segregation of women into certain occupations thought to be appropriate for women, um, occupational stereotyping, uh, even when women are in occupations uh, that are uh, deemed not appropriate for them um, and succeeding, they're still seen as unsuccessful. Hiring and wage discrimination, you know, the wage gap, the gender wage gap has not changed. It doesn't change. It's still about 78 cents to the dollar. It's astonishing. And the homework inter interface. Not only structural issues, uh, and remember these are mostly um, U.S. studies that this is based on, um, not only structural issues like the lack of child care in the U.S. across the board, um, but also attitudinal, which has to do with what um, everybody brings to the idea of whose job it is to raise children, take care of homes, and so forth and so on. The second uh, nagging problem is the underutilization of women's abilities. This comes from things like educational bias, and there's a long list of things that go into uh, educational bias, um, bias classroom practices and pedagogy, uh, harassment of all kinds, low expectations, lack of support, uh, curriculum content that's geared um, for boys or men, not girls or women. Um, and of course, Mr. Cross, guidance, counseling, and testing. Um, and then in addition, lack of parental modeling and support, and this is particularly problematic for people who are first generation, uh, you know, at the upper levels of the, uh, you know, high school levels of education as well as um, post-secondary education um, and low math science participation. And I'm going to come back to that last one in a minute. The third barrier has to do with um, what happens when women get into the workplace. Um, all kinds of barriers to advancement, biases of employers, co-workers, and people who are your subordinates, if you're in any kind of leadership position, micro inequities or cumulative disadvantage. This is like compound interest in reverse, if you think about your checkbook um, and the way compound interest develops. My, this this a micro inequity and the idea of cumulative disadvantage um, basically refers to the idea that you can start, you, you can have a fictitious male and a, and a fictitious female who early in their careers have a teensy, teensy tiny difference in, say, wage. You know, maybe a hundred dollars difference. Over time, that as they, as their wages increase over time, she will lag behind him more and more and more. This gap widens over time um, because he's building his cumulative wages on a higher base that he started with. And there are wonderful computer simulation studies that show how after some really small number, like seven or eight iterations, the gap is, is enormous. Um, so, so starting out inequitably is, is not a small problem. It, it turns into a big problem. Uh, chilly workplaces that are inhospitable to women, uh, various kinds of bias in evaluation, double standards of evaluation. Um, the, the sort of um, joke is that women have to know 10 times more than men to be thought half as good. That's what we talk about as a double standard. Of course, harassment in the workplace as well. Um, tokenism and isolation. Another sort of common joke is if there's more than one woman in the room, everybody thinks the women are taking over. Um, and that is true of other groups too. If there's more than one black person in the room, everybody thinks black people are taking over. Um, exclusion from what used to be called old boy networks, um, but networks where there's a lot of informal communication about how to succeed that's taking place, um, and lack of mentors and role models. Uh, the last two problems have to do with attitudinal barriers. This is the stuff, th this is what happens when all that external stuff 
um, we take in, we incorporate into our sense of self, and it gets translated as low self-efficacy, a low belief that you can actually accomplish certain tasks, low self-concept, low outcome expectations, the belief that even if you do accomplish this task, it's not going to make any difference. It's not going to result in anything positive for you um, at all. And of course, uh, gender socialization, which is um, alive and well. And in many ways, um, is, is certainly alive and well, and in many ways has, um, has sort of gone underground in the sense that a lot of people think it's gone because it's not out there in the really sort of obvious ways in some circles um, that it used to be, but it's pernicious and it's still there and it's just, it's, it's more disguised. Um, we, we call it uh, benign bias, um, although it's not very benign, it's a misnomer, but we get into a whole conversation about language on all this, but we're not going to today. Well, we will a little later. Okay, and then, of course, compounded marginalization. When you talk about intersectional identities and you're dealing with gender, and then you put on top of that um, uh, another marginalized status due to race or ethnicity, social class, sexual orientation, etc. Um, so, this is a lot, right? This is what I thought I was going to learn enough about to fix. So here's my first little digression, my dirty little secret. Um, Zero was never a hero, at least to me. I had a sixth grade teacher who, would, uh, who was an absolutely wonderful teacher, um, and he would fly around the room with a cape on, yelling, zero is a hero. And he'd show us all the magical mathematical things you could do with zeros and decimal points and things like that. Um, it was totally mystifying. It was very exciting, but totally mystifying. I never understood any of it. Um, I already had a deep fear of numbers. Um, Mr. Og, bless his heart, didn't do much to change that. And then when I got to seventh grade and they started talking about negative numbers and imaginary numbers, and it's like I couldn't even deal with the ones that were right in front of me, let alone um, all of this. So I um, emerged into adulthood and spent the first 10 years of my career as a teacher um, being terrified of math and not thinking that I was very good at math or numbers. Um, and um, I, I think, well, I'll, I'll come back to some things about that in a minute. But when I went to graduate school, of course, you know, when I was out teaching English and drama and theater and all that, I didn't need to know very much math. When I went to graduate school and had to take my first statistics class, my goose was majorly cooked. I was a mess. Um, we had big stat classes. We had to take three semesters of it. Hello. At Ohio State. We were in big rooms with 75 or 100 people, all the psychology majors, all the graduate students in the whole university. Um, I was utterly clueless. I mean, I, you, I could not be more clueless. At the midterm, when they posted the distribution of grades, I was at the bottom. I mean, the bottom. And um, Nancy Betts, who some of you may know by reputation, who's a, a world-class vocational psychologist, probably the premier person out there on the vocational psychology of women, was my clinical lab instructor. And of course, all of my role plays had to do with the fact that I was going to flunk out of graduate school, you know, because you have to use your own like problems. Well, I had a big one at that point. I was flunking out, and I was going to flunk out of graduate school. It was very, very clear. Um, and Nancy pulled me aside one day after class, and she said, are you really? doing as poorly in statistics as you say you are, or are you just being dramatic? And I said, well, I am being dramatic, but yes, I am flunking. I am at the bottom of the distribution. There's no way I'm going to pass. She said, you're not stupid. I can tell that. I believe you can learn this. Are you willing to try? And I said, yes. She said, I taught statistics as a graduate student at the University of Minnesota 
Dr. Haverkamp got her degree. And um, she said, I think I can teach you statistics. And she did in three long, scary Friday afternoons. She taught me the whole course, the whole first stat course. Um, so I muddled through with a B. I went to, and so I didn't get kicked out of graduate school. Thank you, whatever deities you all believe in, that was wonderful. Had my second statistics course. You know, I still was not loving statistics, but I got through it with another B or B plus or something. Got to the third statistics course. We are, and it, the third one was on regression. So we go through a wonderful instructor. I was liking it a little better, but still not doing very well. The very last day of that course where I am like so ready to be done with statistics forever. I am never, I'm gonna pick the easiest thesis and dissertation methodology I can possibly think of. And I'm never looking at another number again. As long as I live, I don't care. Um, and the last class of the last day in this class on multiple linear regression, the instructor starts talking about structural equation modeling. And it was, Amazing, and I sat bolt upright in my seat. Suddenly I was awake for the first time in a whole year. Um, and I, I, it was just amazing. I just thought, okay, this is cool. This will give me the tools that I need to answer all of those questions because I can pull it all together in some big grand model and test it and we're all gonna live happily ever after and I'm gonna save the day. And, um, and besides, my advisor doesn't know anything about this methodology so he won't know if I'm doing it right or not. <laughs> um, and so I was very motivated to learn this. So I went up to the instructor at the end of the course and I said, can I be in the structural equation modeling class? He said, well, it's not till next spring and it's only for stat majors. And I said, I really, really, really want to be in this class. And he laughed because he knew that I was struggling. Um, he, he said, I'll tell you what, he said, there are two prerequisites. You have to take two more stat courses before you can take it. He said, if you get through those courses, you can take it. So I plowed through two more classes, took structural equation modeling, and then that's what I spent the early years of my um, research career doing. Um, and just to sort of show you that even the most sorry, ridiculous person can be redeemed, I ended up doing a little stat minor as a result of all of that, just by accident, because I had all those stupid stat courses. Um, so, I was very enamored of structural equation modeling. Its purpose is to test models and um, I was really interested in generating a grand theory that would take all of these nagging problems and allow us to sort of look at them all together and figure out how they related to each other and hopefully figure out how to solve them. Um, I, I've done a lot of different quantitative studies um, on women's career development, I've done some structural equation modeling studies that are not um, on women's career development. So the only three that I'm really going to talk about here are uh, these three. Um, the first one, which I published as a monograph, um, was my thesis project, my master's thesis project, um, with Ohio State students. Um, the second one was my doctoral dissertation project with more Ohio State and UC Santa Barbara students. And then the uh, third study I did was with Karen O'Brien um, when I got into a faculty position later and she was an intern at the counseling center. She wanted to learn structural equation modeling. She said, can I work with you? I said, sure, if I can learn it, anyone can. Um, and so we did a study. We, we took what we were doing down into a population of high school women. Just a second of digression in case, depending on what your quant skills and knowledge is, to sort of show you what structural equation modeling um, looks like. Uh, this is a classic linear regression model. It's some independent variables predicting a dependent variable, right? You all know that. Um, structural equation modeling incorporates path analysis, which is simply an elaboration of basic regression model in which you can have multiple independent variables and multiple dependent variables all sort of affecting one another and interacting. That's what that is. 
in, in this model though, in, in both of these models, you're, you're basically assuming perfect measurement of whatever your construct or your variable is. You're assuming that whatever the measure is you have of it is that thing. So if you have a measure of intelligence, you're gonna use a WASAR or something. That is your variable. Um, Factor, uh, structural equation modeling also incorporates factor analysis. That's the other important part of the elaboration of structural equation modeling. In factor analysis, you don't assume you have perfect measurement. In fact, you assume that you never have perfect measurement of, of, of anything and that complex constructs or variables often need multiple kinds of measures to tap the different aspects of something. So for example, intelligence, you might want a measure of social intelligence, you might want a measure of technical savvy, you might want you know, the basic academic IQ, several. And what, that, and what the factor analysis model then uh, gives you is several measures of what is supposedly an underlying construct um, that you name, um, and it will tell you how these, how you, how these, um, how accurately and completely, comprehensively, uh, these measured variables actually tap into this construct that you think you're measuring. Okay, so a structural equation model then has a whole bunch of these. Okay, these. Um, uh, latent variables here, the circles, each measured by two or three or four or five depending measures. So the first um, study that I um, attempted to do uh, was this relatively elaborate model of women's career development. I explained structural equation modeling to Nancy Betts and Louise Fitzgerald. I locked them in a room with me for three days and numerous bottles of wine. And I said, I want you two to take everything you know about women's career development, which was a considerable amount. They were writing a book on it at the time, which got published right around that time. Um, please put it all together in a model I can test. So this is the model they came up with. And you can see in this model that there's a whole thing about previous experience, academic success, influence of role models, encouragement, stuff like that, predicting some attitudinal variables, sex roles and achievement attitudes and so forth, um, influencing uh, preferences and plans or intentions, and then the realism of career choice. Is it realistic in terms of both field and level? Is it in the general area of interest that a person has? And is it also um, appropriate to a person's measured abilities? Okay, so that's what we mean by realism of career choice. Looks pretty, right? Um, I didn't even bother to give you the whole elaborated structural equation modeling model because it doesn't really fit on a piece of paper very well. So you can see it. But just imagine that each of these has three or four little rectangles attached to it and they all have error terms and so you're measuring paths, you're measuring all kinds of things. Now, the nice thing about this, about this method and the reason I was so enchanted with it is you can actually test your measurement model separately from your structural model. So you can first find out if you, the measures that you've decided are gonna be your measures of all these constructs. You can find out if that model is decent or not before you go about the business of trying to figure out if the paths among all these latent variables actually make sense. So that's a, that's a huge big deal to be able to tease out those two pieces of a very, very thorny problem. And that's why I was so enchanted by it. Um, when I started doing these studies in the early 80s, the only program that was out there was a clunky computer program called Lizrel. And of course, we also had clunky computers, so the only way you could do anything was with boxes and boxes and boxes of punch cards. And um, you, in order to use that old Lizrel program, you had to know matrix algebra, so I had had to learn matrix algebra and I had to specify all this crap, and if you put one period wrong, you had to redo the whole box. And I mean, it was just crazy, crazy, crazy. And you'd feed it in and it would take 
hours for it to come out, and then you'd find out it hadn't run at all. Um, <laughs> what the what the what the program does in order to test models is it uses an iterative process um, to uh, compare the model that you've specified, which was my model, you know, with all my measures and everything else, and all my paths. Um, it maps that against the actual data that you have, the, the, the data you have on all those measures you collected from all those hundreds and hundreds of people um, to see if the model that you're proposing actually fits. And the nice thing about it, this is the other beauty of it, you're, you're probably thinking to yourself, how could anything go wrong? Um, the, the other beauty of it is that it gives you, once it finally does spit out a solution, which it will eventually do it once you get it right, um, it will tell you, it gives you all kinds of indices that tell you where things are wrong in it, what's not fitting. Um, is, are these two variables measured poorly? Um, are measures loading on more than one factor? Do we have huge error terms for some of these? Do we have paths that don't make any sense whatsoever or are insignificant and need to be taken out? Um, all kinds of things. So as we test models, we can go in and refine them and change things, you know, um, subtract a measure that's not working very well and see if that improves things. Rearrange some variables. Um, in order to not be here all night, I'm going to show you the results here of the very first study. Now, remember, this is where I started. Okay? This is where I ended up. You can see it's a simplified model. Um, you can also see that there are some things that have changed. Um, I now have and remember, all the fit information told me this. Um, Ability is still in there. I've now got a variable that's called achievement orientation. I've got a variable called feminist orientation. Who knew where that came from? I've got family and career orientation being predicted. Um, and then career choice. I'm still trying to predict career choice. Well, that was okay. Um, it certainly taught us uh, it taught me a lot about how to work with these models. And so I fearlessly then went into the next study with this model, some modifications of this model, um, to test it again on a much, much bigger sample. As you could imagine, um, these require very, very large samples in order to be able to run these models. I'll save you all the drama of that, but what I ended up with there was a, a not dissimilar model um, we've still got ability in here, although ability's got some multiple loadings. Um, we've now got a variable called agency. Um, uh, sex roles, that took several iterations in these models. I've still got career orientation and career choice, um, but nothing left over here. I'm, I'm predicting these two major variables here. Um, I'm still predicting career choice that's being measured by the traditionality and prestige of it, but science now has entered into it because it's become clear that math and science predicts um, these things. So you, you can see, I, and I could spend hours talking about each of these, but you can see that I'm sort of, there's some uh, similarity that you see in these models over time. The third one I did with Karen O'Brien, we basically started out with this one, the same uh, latent variables, fixed, fudged, fixed a few measures, and we added mom, the influence of mothers, because Karen was quite enchanted in her high school samples with uh, the number of them that kept talking about the influence of their mothers. Um, so we added mom in, and sure enough, it turned out that mom uh, had some predictive capacity in that model. So you can see that in this final model, we end up with ability being important, uh, this sense of agency, you know, people feeling that they can do something, um, gender role um, variable, and mom predicting career orientation and career choice. Okay, so this is, I don't know how many years now, we, maybe a decade's gone by and I've been doing this. Um, 
And these are the things we concluded from all of this work. First of all, career orientation for women is connected to family orientation. You almost can't look at one without the other. And all the career orientation measures, no matter how we kept moving them around, measures of family orientation were always there and always loading on them. Um, career orientation is distinct from career aspiration. You can want a career badly and really be dying to be in that career, but not necessarily have any kind of aspirations to advance in it in any sort of ladder kind of way. Um, ability all by itself doesn't play in these models. You can see what happened to it. It got expressed through agency and gender role characteristics. So the raw ability itself got funneled through the um, lens of agency and gender roles. Um, Gender roles and attitudes were important predictors of career variables. We knew that, but this was a this was one of the first times that uh, it really sort of got um, highlighted in research. Uh, and the mother-daughter relationship is important in some populations, um, and that the findings appeared to hold across demographic groups because these samples were very large, very diverse, um, and we didn't find. Uh, systematic differences when we tested. Oh, the other thing I forgot to mention, the other wonderful thing about structural equation modeling is you can test competing models. So you can take this group of people and apply your model to them and test it if you have enough of them. And then these people and test it and see if your models uh, look the same. There's other fancy stuff you can do. So by this time, I was starting to get really disenchanted with structural equation modeling. I had put a lot of time into this, and I felt like I hadn't really generated any kind of grand theory at all. In fact, my theoretical models kept getting smaller and smaller and smaller, which is, you know, part of the reason I decided that part of the reason they finally fit better is because they were just smaller models and therefore easier to specify. So what I was getting was statistical artifacts, not really any grand theory that I could do anything with, and I was feeling um, a little disappointed. Um, here's my second digression. I love women, all women, and when women are in art of some kind, I am right there. And around about this time, there was um, an exhibit at the Corcoran in Washington, D.C., a uh, museum, and um, it was called I Dream a World, and it was um, portraits of I don't know, 25, 30, 40, I don't remember how many black women who changed America. It was I Dream a World, black women who changed America. It was these life-size portraits. You know, they're up on the wall, these black and white portraits, and there's these awesome women. And they're, oh my God, it was just amazing. I went to this exhibit over and over and over and over again. I couldn't get enough of it. And I'd stand there just looking at these women um, just thinking they were so awesome and wishing I could talk to them. And I was with a friend of mine one day, and we were looking at the, I took her to the exhibit, and I said, don't you wish you could talk to these women? And she said, Ruth, you're a psychologist. That's what you do all day. You talk to people. You can talk to women if you want to. I said, <laughs> I can talk to women. OMG. Well, we didn't say OMG then, but um, I thought I can talk to women. And that started me down a completely different path of research um, when I started thinking about what would it look like to actually talk about women uh, or talk to women. I discovered that there was this whole branch of research that I didn't know anything about that was called qualitative research. And there were really cool people out there doing it. I, I of course, didn't know any of them because, you know, I had been taught this strict Midwest Dust Bowl empiricist model. Um, and I had absolutely no idea how to even think about doing anything else. So I set about the business of teaching this to myself and with a bunch of my graduate students. And um, I landed on grounded theory. Um, Remember, my goal here, I'm still trying to generate a grand theory, right? So this is where I'm headed. I still think I'm going to find this theory. If I can just figure out the right way to do it, I'll find it. Um, and so, and grounded theory allows you to do that. It allows you to create theory from narrative. Um, 
The other thing I liked about grounded theory is it had pretty um, um, clear, I guess would be a word I would use, pretty clear structured approach to data analysis. Because when I started reading about qualitative research, I didn't even understand half the words people were using for various kinds of epistemologies. And, and then when I got to trying to read about what they actually did with the data once they had it, it was like, what? What? I don't, I don't get it at all. Grounded theory was clear. It had very clear paths for how you go about doing things, and I needed that structure. So I taught myself grounded theory. We did five different studies, and um, we did them in particular groups of women um, to look at uh, different sources of discrimination and bias. Um, and you can see the groups here with the, with the significant um, graduate students who worked with me. We did all of these in large research teams, but these were the graduate student leaders of those teams. Um, the purpose was to try to figure out how, like, the most successful women out there, the top women in the United States at that time, um, how have they overcome these various challenges, sexism, racism, homophobia, heterosexism, et cetera, in their professional development. And of course, because I am very persistent, I'm still trying to come up with the grand theory that's going to show us how to do this. We recruited and selected participants through uh, their visibility in the media, panels of experts, nominations from professional organizations. We had about 20 to 30 participants in each study, depending in each of the five studies. Um, they represented in each study, the whole field of occupations was represented. So we had science, law, politics, religion, athletics, etc. Um, the average age of our, uh, across all of the samples was 47. This makes sense. These are the top women in the United States. So they had to have a few years under their belts in order to have achieved at those levels. Um, most had completed college, not all, which was interesting. Uh, and many had completed advanced degrees. Uh, lots of various kinds of racial ethnic groups um, reflecting some of the... Um, diversity in the US. Um, the uh, average number partnered across uh, uh, within each of the five studies was 12. The average number with children was 10. Lesbians were the most often partnered, 20 out of 27. Women with disabilities were the least often partnered, 8 out of 21. Women with disabilities were also the least likely to have children, 6 out of 21. And these are the uh, disabilities that we included. We stuck with physical sensory disabilities, not things like learning disabilities or more invisible disabilities, because we were, tr remember, part of what we're trying to get at here is the way in which outside prejudice, bias, slams people. Um, we interviewed each participant for about 90 minutes in a location of her choice. This means we were using all of our frequent flyer miles, flying all over the country, visiting relatives we hadn't seen in a really, really long time <clears throat> um, because we tried to go to, to them. Um, because we were doing each of these studies with a large um, research team, including undergraduates, graduates and undergraduates. We interviewed in pairs so that we had some kind of match between at least one of the interviewers and the participants. So for example, if we were interviewing an African American lesbian, we would make sure that we, ideally we would send somebody who was a lesbian and somebody who was an African American. If not, we would at least send one of those, person from one of those demographic groups. Um, to sort of increase uh, the sense that we could be trusted interviewers. And these are the kinds of things we covered, family and cultural background, education, work experiences, et cetera, et cetera. Um, we used the grounded theory approach um, because as you could see from the structural equation modeling studies, we were pretty convinced, I was pretty convinced at this time, uh, that we did not really have a lot of measures that were really good measures for some of the things we were trying to tap into. We used uh, large and device, di 
diverse research teams, um, and we analyzed the data using the grounded theory method of identifying common themes, um, grouping them into increasingly larger categories of meaning. Um, Here's the punchline, here's what we found. There are lots of common experiences across these samples based on gender, duh. Um, there are also unique experience related to their intersectional identities. I'm gonna share a little flavor of some of these results with you. Um, I think altogether, the, the studies differed in how many themes we found and what the overall models looked like at the end for each of them. The, the theory that got generated, a, a pictorial representation of the theory. Um, but overall, in terms of the largest, grandest uh, categories of meaning, uh, you, in general there were somewhere around 18 to 25. I'm, I'm gonna share three of them with you. I'm going to share a little bit with you about barriers and challenges, career attitudes, and the work-family interface. I thought these might be uh, of interest to you um, in part because we're tapping into all the, um, all the isms that we were trying to tap into and I thought you might also be interested in some of the work-family interface stuff. Um, and the career attitudes were, were pretty um, clear uh, also in these samples. So let's start with barriers and challenges. If you look across the samples, you see some common themes. Challenges of sexism uh, and gender, challenges of other kinds of isms and obias, um, and uh, the um, interaction of all of those. So I'm gonna, in classic, you know, qualitative fashion, I'm gonna share just a few of my favorite quotations. Um, this is a white lesbian medical school professor and she'd been fired from her job. It was a very public case. Um, and she talks about her multiple identities. A lot of attention to multiple identities in the sample. I have a strong opinion and I speak out in favor of my female patient. And I'm also very smart and very quick and some people think I have a tart tongue. But if I were a man, this would be accepted behavior. So after 10 years as an assistant professor, I was not renewed for a thousand different little reasons none of which was a strong reason, which is the typical thing. It's not racism, it's not sexism, it's not homophobia, it's that you aren't competent, people don't like you, you're not well accepted, you don't get along well, you don't bill enough. You know, a thousand different little reasons. This is an African American lawyer with a disability who talked about her multiple identities in an all white school. My first day I was called nigger this, nigger that, nigger all day long on the playground. My second day it was nigger cripple, cripple. I realized that in order to deal with these types of attitudes, I was going to have to effectively get people to engage with me as a person because violence was not part of my upbringing, so I couldn't kick ass. They talked, a number of them talked about the conflicting allegiances that come up from intersectional identities. This is an African American lesbian politician. People perceive me as not being black enough. I get that from some of the gay black community based on who my partner is. My detractors say, well, as long as you sleep with a white woman, I'm not giving you my vote. I also get that from the straight black community who feel I can't be gay and black and have equal allegiances to both. You know, you've got to have only one allegiance. This is a Latina. Uh, artist and educator, I think, who sums up the sense of otherness that a lot of them describe. I've never had a sense of this protection or stability of the middle class. I always believe that in a given moment, if I'm standing on the wrong corner, I could be thrown in a van with a bunch of other people. You know, my English might save me because they, they would think I wasn't Chicana, but I don't ever feel totally, really safe. This is a white psychologist with a disability. Um, I had applied for an internship and I had this lengthy interview with the guy who was in charge. And at the end he said to me, well, I've got to admit you know your stuff, but you have polio. And no matter what I read in the reports about polio, I think it's neurological. It's brain damage. You're essentially a brain damaged person. And I can't trust our clients to a brain damaged person. And that was the end of that. I was really furious and upset. I went to my advisor and the head of the clinical division and told them what this guy had said. And their response was to pat me on the shoulder and say, that's really rough. <laughs> That's not fair. Maybe next year you'll get an assistantship. They wouldn't go to bat for me. They wouldn't encourage me to fight it or anything. I was very alone. 
This is a white lesbian school teacher. I guess I'm always reading my environment constantly, reading people's faces, watching how people watch me when I'm interacting with kids. Like if I wear something to work one day that's not as butch, I always think, oh, they'll love this. This is 1% feminine. <laughs> this is an African-American artist. They were outrageous. I had a business partner who did not want me in her private home when she was having professional parties where I was the assistant on the show. Any policy making parties I'd be totally alienated from. African American artists did not have a chance in hell. And this is the last one in this category. Um, a Latina lesbian, very high ranking uh, military, uh, decorated military officer said this, when I got out after 20 years, I wasn't happy. I wasn't jubilant that I had finished a rewarding career. I was happy that I got out without getting caught. And that's unfortunate. When 12 midnight came on my last day, I was happy that I walked out the door by myself, that nobody opened the door and kicked me out. And that's what I lived with all my career, that I could actually go to jail. So what did these women do about some of this prejudice and discrimination. These are some of what we found uh, in our samples about how they handled it. Uh, ignoring it, if that was possible and appropriate. Challenging it not only personally, but collectively with other people. Uh, using humor to de-escalate. Uh, persevering. Educating others, both formally as well as just informally in day-to-day -day, uh, interactions. Passing hiding aspects of oneself uh, in order to fit in better with the dominant culture, getting support from similar others, and working actively to make the world a fairer place. And this last one leads us into the next category, which is career attitudes. And what you see here, again, is some similarity um, across the uh, groups. The whole idea of a uh, career as a, as a passion, as a mission, as something you're called to. And then the way in which you judge yourself in your career, not just by what other people think of you, but what your own internal standards are of excellence. And then using your uh, career to make a difference for other people, to make the world a better place. So this is a Latina scientist uh, talking about success is making contribution. Success is feeling that as an individual I've contributed. That validation gives your whole life a flavor that makes you happy to be alive. This is a lesbian African American minister. Success for me is related to what I do. Our lives change because that's what the ministry is really about. Do people come into closer relationships with God? Do they find more joy in living? Or if they're dying, do they die more peacefully? So has my life in the ministry touched the lives of people? I think that would be more what it is to be successful. This is a white journalist who says, I've reached something in this town, this is Washington, D.C., she's talking about, which is a very tough town, that I would call success, that I've lived by my standards, that I've rep represented a certain brand of journalism, that I have integrity. I really feel extremely fulfilled and enriched by the fact that I didn't compromise or ever sell myself out, that I did what was in my gut always. I never judged myself on how much I made. I judged myself on what I did. And this is a white businesswoman. I think you can only be successful if you're tying what you do in your work life with your passions. So to me, a successful person is a person who is able in their occupation to follow their passions and do those things that they want most in the world to do. What I want to do in life is I want to change the world and make it a fairer place. Here's an Asian American journalist who talks on her approach to social change. I hope to put my yellow face up there enough every single day so that people understand I'm an American just like they are. And if somehow I've changed their perception of Asian Americans, then that's great. This is a white lesbian comedian who uses her humor to change the world. I get to do what I want to do, which is to change the world and make them accept gay people and women and all minorities and to see us not in stereotypes, but to see us as people. 
there are some compromises when you do this kind of work and this uh, writer performer with a disability talks about doing politically motivated work. Everything that I've developed in terms of my skill as a performer very much comes from my politics and that's a very different kind of art and as I go along I don't want to lose any of the fire, the passion and the politics. Disability is still very much looked on as a special audience and there's a reality about how far you can go if you stay true to the things that are of passion and the heart. And it's not just cripples who have this problem, it's women, it's black people, it's queer stuff, it's all of it. This is a Latina uh, artist educator who talks about cultural contradictions that come into success. Living here, she's talking about the US, living here prescribes forced choices between being with people that you love and are raised with and succeeding. Because in order to succeed, you have to be different than the rest of your family, community, and culture. Predominant culture teaches that you're successful because of your own unique, particular qualities. So you can't have collective, collective success here. But the success I've had in my career is directly related to my staying connected to a community that I represent in the eyes of other people. And if I had gone it alone and sort of whiteified myself and tried to do that other thing, I don't think I would have been nearly as successful. It's an odd kind of contradiction. This is an Asian American professor who describes this interconnectivity. I am who I am because of everything, my family, my friends, my life. So the choices I make, I can't separate them as saying these are the sacrifices I make for my family or this is what happened at work. This is who I am. These are the choices I make. This is a Jewish lesbian attorney and public official. I wouldn't have been able to take the chances I've taken. I wouldn't have been able to disrupt my life in the way that I've done to answer this particular calling if it hadn't been for having a sound and loving and mutually supportive relationship with my partner. Here's our Latina college president again. We supported my husband's career when we were first married. I took care of the kids in the house and everything. When I got the position of college president, it was his turn. My husband is very much a Latin male. If there were letters from school, a letter a teacher to be seen, it was my job. But he assumed many of those responsibilities when I took the new job. He changed his life. So white lesbian physician. She says, I have a supportive network of two other lesbian couples. Both of them are 10 years older than my spouse and I, and we call ourselves La Familia, and we're there for each other. It's kind of funny because three of us have lost our jobs at different times for being feminist slash lesbians, and we've hung together, and we say, let's all go out and do this, but just the family. And these gals, we're gonna grow old with them. This is a woman with a disability, talking about her disability community as her family. I feel good about being there. I feel that all of us are given a little extra strength to go out into the world because you know it can be a scary place for anybody, but we all know who we are there and what our value is there and that we set a high price on ourselves there. It gives us strength to be in other contexts. This is an African-American phys lesbian physician. And here you start to see some of the conflicts about what happens um, when you have maybe hidden families. When things happen for either one of us, we want to be there and be supportive for the other one. If that support conflicts with work, it's very hard because you have to choose. I know for me, I have to always feel like I have to choose work since I'm not willing to come out. Um, this is uh, an a Asian American law professor who talks about the additional burdens that being a person with intersectional identities represents in the workplace. The triple shift of having to do work, family, and the extra work that comes from being a woman and a person of color, it's a quadruple shift. I have students in my office who come here because they've been sexually assaulted, sexually harassed for career advice, all kinds of things. They don't feel they can go to their white professors. I do more than other people because there aren't enough people like me to go around. And then sh this same person goes on to comment about the work-home struggle. There is no strategy to survive juggling work and family. It's impossible. My kids are in full-time daycare. I've just hired a housekeeper, but there's only so much of that that you can do. It still doesn't make it survivable. If one of them gets sick or I get sick or my husband gets sick, we're thrown into total chaos. 
And uh, this is the last comment in this area from a Latina businesswoman who says the balance between family and work is a challenge. I believe that you can have it all, you just can't have it all at the same time. So you have to make choices. So, did I discover my grand theory? Well, kind of, sort of. Um, all of the theories that got generated out of these five studies looked sort of similarly Brunfenbrenner-esque. Um, this is partly an artifact of the way grounded theory takes you through the process of generating theory, but I think it's also true because there is a Brunfenbrenner-esque kind of quality to the way our individual selves are nested in uh, immediate contexts of families and workplaces and so forth, which in turn are nested in larger sociocultural uh, institutions and influences. And that's what you see here. And then you also see at the bottom the sort of trajectories that come from that self interacting in all of those contexts around um, vocational issues. So you've got managing multiple roles. These are the big, big themes that came out across the samples. Managing multiple roles, addressing challenges and barriers, um, sizing up and seizing opportunities, empowering oneself and empowering others, uh, developing a work ethic and career aspirations, developing ability, skills, and competencies, and exploring occupational choices and fit. So that's sort of interesting and cool. Now, the problem is I don't have the vaguest idea how to test it, and neither, neither does anyone else. If, if you sort of take all of this and put it in words, not pictures, these are, I think, the most important lessons that I learned across all of these studies. And I learned things about myself from each of these lessons that I learned about other women, because remember, Research is always me-search, and I'm still trying to figure out how my own career path fits as I study all of these, by this time, hundred, easily more than a thousand women. Okay, so, first of all, I think we've established pretty clearly in all of this research um, that we did that work roles are healthy for women. Um, having a crappy job and crappy pay isn't particularly good for you, but generally having work roles is healthy. Um, so I feel good about my own workaholism. Um, Nonlinear career paths really typified um, the women uh, in these qualitative studies in particular, which also made me feel bad as someone who's been meandering around finding myself. Um, the importance of education came through in all of these studies, the quantitative and the qualitative studies. Women need more of it just to do the same things that men do. Now luckily demographic shifts, at least in the US, I don't know what Canada looks like, show us that women in fact are getting educated um, and in fact are the majority of people in systems of higher education in the US at this point in time. This is a big one, and we saw it in both the quantitative and the qualitative. The importance of family attitudes. It wasn't about what your family had in terms of resources. Um, we had lots and lots of people who came from very, very poor backgrounds. It was more the attitudes that the families had about education and achievement and so forth. That made me feel good too because I came from a very poor family. I thought, okay, so I wasn't so disadvantaged. I certainly learned about the importance of work and education. Um, extensive experience coping with oppression and discrimination, strong belief in self. Um, the ability to take challenges and turn them into opportunities, critically important. This it, passion for work and dedication to work, work as something more than um, just a, a job or education, more than just a path to a career, but as something you're intensely caring about. Internal standards of success, um, gender role flexibility, hugely important. I would also add to that the gender role flexibility of the people around you who are important influences on your life. 
uh, interconnectedness with others, both supporting others and having others support you, the integration of the professional and the personal, um, that sort of inseparability of what you're doing in your personal life and your professional life, the commitment to the struggle for equality and social justice, um, the unique perspective of otherness that being a pioneer confers, and tremendous optimism and persistence in the face of challenges. And I couldn't resist just two more quotations about that. This is an African-American uh, public official physician by training. You've got a mission and you must move forward with your mission. Take the abuse, take whatever it is. You knew when you came here it was not going to be easy. If it was easy, it would have been done. So just go forward. And this is the, uh, our Latina, one of our Latina scientists. She says, I'm always full of optimism. Like in Spanish we say, no hay mal que por bien no venga. There is no bad from which good cannot come. There's something good even from the worst situations that can come in your life. It's just sometimes you have to look harder for them. So in this spirit of optimism, what are we going to do next? What am I going to do next? I don't know what I'm going to do next. But here's what I think we, the royal we, you, <laughs> need to do next. Um, I, I think it's pretty clear, if you believe anything I just said to you for the last hour, that becoming comfortable with a variety of research methods is really, really, really important. You can't solve problems just knowing one little narrow way to go about getting knowledge. And despite the fact that I'm being sort of, um, uh, obviously there's a sort of mixture here of some optimism and some pessimism because I'm not entirely convinced that, um, well, my, my search for the grand theory is certainly not over by any stretch of the imagination. And I'm not even convinced that my sort of half-baked uh, theories are all that great. Um, but I'm better off as I move forward trying to think about what to do next, knowing that I have a lot of tools at my disposal than if I only had one. No matter how wonderful that one might be, it's not the be-all and end-all, and you need to have uh, flexibility. I think some lessons about education, um, and this applies to all of us as well as people we will eventually educate, whether through therapy or, or professional jobs, um, is that we have to build positive outcome expectations and self-efficacy in everybody, ourselves and everyone else. And any way you can learn and get knowledge has to be um, valued uh, and honored. As we create organizational change, I think all of these studies um, that I've done really show the importance of intersectionality. It's not just one piece of your identity that's connected to gender. It's all of the other cultural pieces about who you are um, that, that uh, form your direction um, and keep you uh, going down the paths that you go down. And as we create affirmative environments, hopefully that's our goal and that's what we'll do, we have to do it in a way that honors everyone's um, complexity. And then in our mental health practice, um, I, I think we really have to do everything we can to honor the fact that Things aren't easy, and there is often struggle, but there are dreams, there are possible dreams that people have that are realistic dreams, and we can honor those. And I'm going to finish with one more quotation, because of course I can't resist. Um, and this is an African-American educator, and she's summing up this whole talk, which is everybody ought to have that dream of what they want to be. And even if you can't be it now, understand that it's still possible. You should understand that no does not mean never. No means not now. No, not right now, but it doesn't mean no, not tomorrow. Every dream you have, it's very possible. <laughs>